Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and a massive week of news again this week. Starship development is still progressing steadily, and we've spotted a mysterious ring segment with square holes cut out, so some thoughts around that. There's been a few worrisome accidents at the Texas site this week as well, as more news around the Raptor engine development. We of course had Falcon 9's flight for the JC Sat-18 Pacific One mission. We'll be talking about the amazing Starliner mission, and we'll also introduce you to NASA's upcoming X-59 supersonic research aircraft. So yes, a huge amount to cover, so let's get stuck into it. Work continues on with the Starship in Boca Chica, Texas. Sadly, information is a little hard to come by right now, seeing as progress seems to be a little slower than many of us were expecting. There has been interesting work going on with the ring segments, as we can see here from some of these shots by Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight. Again, there have been huge amounts of parts and material delivered, so although we're still not seeing any ring stacking yet, it may not be that far away. This is an interesting shot here where we can see an image of this ring with square holes cut out of it. Now, there has been a lot of debate about what these are for. I suspect they're simple cut and weld test trials going on, as it was believed these rings were already marked for scrap anyway. Although it looks like SpaceX has begun stacking here, they appear to just be sitting together with wedges of some sort. It's more than likely just a test stack process for future rings. The writing here around the test cutouts to me seems almost like a joke for all of us watching. It talks here of UFO docking tests and whatnot, so yeah, seems strange. There's an interesting tower illustrated here which may simply be an indication of what SpaceX are trying to avoid when stacking the rings together. They need to be very accurate and precise rings with near perfect alignment in order for the stack to line up correctly when the entire stack is assembled. It seems like there is a lot of time and energy going into these initial ring segments, so I think there's a certain amount of paranoia going on to ensure that the rings are the correct size and will match up as expected. As we've learned in the past, the Mark II Starship in Florida was also suffering from this issue of ring sizes being mismatched. As soon as they've got the best method for constructing these rings, I'm sure we'll see stacking kicking off quite rapidly. We've also heard news on the Raptor engine progress. Elon Musk tweeted early in the week saying that SpaceX have just finished an engineering review with SpaceX Propulsion. Engine 17 is about to ship to McGregor with some holiday style. Back on September 28th, Elon had mentioned they were testing the 12th engine, so if we average that out, the number of Raptors there, there's around one engine every 15 to 16 days or so. The plan, of course, is for SpaceX to be churning out a Raptor per day when they have got a solid version ready to be mass produced for the first super heavy booster. Sadly, there were a few safety concerns this week though. Uh, this footage here by Lab Padre captured this accident here where a crane cable broke and dropped this massive tent rafter component. Now, this was a bit of a close call, right? These two guys were quite lucky to get out of the way, and you know, it's lucky they didn't get hurt or worse. Um, there was another incident as well with a ring segment which dropped due to a broken strap. And based on these few accidents happening so close together, it might be time to review some of the health and safety practices going on at Texas there. If there had been an injury or even a death, it's of course not only terrible for those involved, but the site would more than likely need to be shut down while investigations took place. Although we want to see the new Starship come together quickly, we certainly don't want to see shortcuts or safety concerns to get there. Now, of course, we also had the Falcon 9 launch at the start of the week, launching the JC Sat 18 Pacific 1 communications payload. We were all pretty hyped up for this mission simply because we finally had both of the recovery ships, Go Miss Tree as well as Go Miss Chief, out at the recovery zone, uh, attempting to catch both fairing halves at the same time. This has never been done before. We did have a single fairing catch by Go Miss Tree back in June of 2019. What we were hoping to see this time though was a double catch with both ships. Sadly, Miss Tree and Miss Chief narrowly missed catching the fairing halves. Now, a lot of the time, the fairings can still be fished out of the ocean in a reasonably useful condition. Even if they're not caught, due to their shape, they will float quite nicely as seen from some of these shots here. As it turned out, of course, they were indeed fished out of the ocean and returned, as we saw from various sources. Richard Engel here, shooting for Tesla Rati, had some nice shots of the ships returning with the fairing. Now, a number of people regularly ask why 
this is important. Visually, the fairings just look like an empty shell structure and it may seem strange that SpaceX are spending their time and effort retrieving what looks to be a fairly insignificant portion of the entire vessel. The thing is though, these fairings are very expensive to make. Their numbers are possibly a little dated now, but in the past at least, Elon has said that the fairing is a $5 million component. If SpaceX can reduce or eliminate that by recovering undamaged fairings as frequently as possible, that's a big cost saving factor and would allow SpaceX to instead invest that saving somewhere else. Perhaps in Starship development, who knows. A few interesting points with this mission. Firstly, this was the quickest flight turnaround for the same launch pad, which in this case was Space Launch Complex 40. Uh, the CRS-19 mission launched only 11 days prior to this mission, and previously the quickest flight turnaround was 12 days. The faster SpaceX can launch these vessels, the faster we can see customer missions fly, and of course, the Starlink constellation fill out around the globe. This was also the third time this first stage booster had flown. The booster, designated B1056, had flown on the CRS-17 mission, which was a drone ship landing, as well as the CRS-18 mission, where it returned to landing zone 1. The Falcon 9's second stage boosted the payload into a geostationary transfer orbit and released the satellite. This transfer orbit looks something like this. This is a highly elliptical orbit and allows SpaceX's second stage to easily return to re-enter the atmosphere to minimize that space junk. Now, once the satellite reaches the correct point in the orbit, it then needs to circularize by using its own thrusters to place itself into that geostationary orbit at around 35,790 kilometers above the Earth's equator. This type of orbit is perfect for communication networks given that observers on the Earth see the satellite stationary in the sky. If you'd like to know a little more about this type of orbit and differences with other geosynchronous orbits, I covered that a little bit more in my video last week when talking about why SpaceX are testing new modifications to the second stage of the Falcon 9. Of course, if you're interested in my content here, please do consider subscribing. There is loads to keep up with right now with Starship development, Starlink, Crew Dragon, you name it, I would love to share it all with you. Now, Boeing's Starliner capsule launch has been the talk of the week. Everything has been on track for a Friday launch, and this is an interesting one, right? This is Starliner's first orbital mission, and following in SpaceX's footsteps who sent Ripley on the Crew Dragon test flight, Starliner has on board here Rosie the test dummy. Wait, Rosie? I've heard that somewhere else before recently, haven't I? We've just stepped inside Rosie the Robot, Rocket Lab's newest piece of automation equipment. So yes, this is of course an unpiloted test flight to the International Space Station. Just like Crew Dragon, Boeing's Starliner is part of the huge push to allow the United States to launch astronauts again from American soil. That hasn't been possible since the shuttle took its last flight in 2011, so it seems like a bit of a race here to see who is going to be the first to launch with crew on board. Now obviously the original plan was to dock at the space station, but after an issue with the onboard mission clock mess up the automated maneuvers, Starliner didn't reach its target orbit as intended. This meant that the vessel didn't have enough fuel on board to meet up and dock with the International Space Station while still having enough fuel to return to the landing site. In order to tick off as many objectives as possible for the orbital test flight, Starliner is now going to land six days earlier than its original December 28th target. Now, I've got to say, compared to the coverage of the Crew Dragon's test flight, the coverage of Starliner here I found pr pretty disappointing. No data shown, no graphics of the flight plan, no video of the vessel at all after the booster separation. We just essentially sat here watching people staring at screens for almost an hour. And look, people leave comments on this channel saying that I cover SpaceX too much compared to the other providers, but you know, this is kind of why. We can't talk about this stuff in depth unless the material is here to talk about. So yes, after the partial mission success or partial mission failure, depending on how you look at it, the landing will take place at White Sands after the deorbit burn. If all goes to plan, that landing attempt should be occurring after this video launches, and that's more than likely already played out at this point. As with the abort test we witnessed back at the start of November, we'll be seeing the Starliner touch down with the aid of three parachutes. Well, hopefully three. One of the three failed to do its job on the pad abort test in November. Fingers crossed they've actually clipped them all on this time. Um, of course, 
the Starliner also has these crazy airbags to help break the fall on impact as it touches down at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Um, and this essentially will stop saltwater damage and allow the Starliner capsule to be reused a number of times. Now one thing that did surprise me was when Jim Bridenstine said that it may be possible for the next Starliner flight to occur with crew and used the example of the shuttle having always been crewed. Considering that the docking process has not yet taken place, I would have thought that another test flight would have been required to test it all out and check those systems before sending crew up. It's going to be interesting to see whether another non-crewed flight will be required here. Now the other day NASA tweeted out a mock image of the upcoming X-59 supersonic research aircraft saying that it had been cleared for final assembly. This image here by Lockheed Martin shows the X-59 main assembly coming together. Uh, this vessel is designed to reduce the volume of sonic booms to something more of a gentle thump as heard from ground level. To test this there will be various selected communities that will be recording sensor data and analysing the change that this design is intended to have on that volume. If all goes well and audio levels are as low as predicted, this may well allow commercial supersonic aircraft to travel over land in the future. The construction of the X-59 itself is being done at Lockheed Martin's Skunk Works factory in California at a contracted cost, I believe, around $247 million. I really can't wait to see this aircraft take shape. Finally today, I just wanted to share a few of these renderings here. I must say, I've been pretty impressed lately by this community. If you're not following the work of Kimi Talvitier here, you should certainly take a look. Just brilliant, all of the renderings created here. I did get a good laugh of this latest Cybertruck video as well, with what I think we can assume is a Raptor engine attached. Now, you can find all sorts of great merch on the site here. I've got a link in the description if you want to check that out. Probably a little late for Christmas, but if you're after some post-holiday cheer, lots of great posters and stickers and all that sort of gear here. Check that out and support the work. Without the awesome community doing what they do, I can't do what I do. Now many of my early subscribers signed up to follow me due to my previous Kerbal Space Program simulations. Now, although I'm not focusing on that content so much these days, I still get blown away by the incredible work done by the community. A quick shout out here to Adam who runs the Gameplay Review UK channel. He spent probably thousands of hours painstakingly replicating historical spacecraft and creating this great content. This Skylab mission posted during the week has got some amazing real Skylab footage I'd never seen before mixed in with the vessel recreation and simulation. So awesome for that alone. He includes all the detail here he can and he does this in an attempt to learn about the history of space flight and the physics involved at the same time as creating awesome content. Matthew Cable here also doing some amazing work with a recreation of the Crew Dragon mission earlier in the year. The time it takes to build and put these missions together along with the cinematics can be quite extensive and there's loads of missions such as the Apollo 11 creation here with incredible detail as well. He even goes as far as to recreate the Cape Canaveral launch site and things of that nature. So yes, I've got a link to both of these videos in the description. If you want to see more, go and check those out and support those channels. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do take a second and hit that like button. A huge thank you to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be part of this, follow my Discord or Twitter link in the description and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about CRS-19 and the Falcon 9 Stage 2 upgrades for future military missions. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, a video that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.